All right. Hello, everyone that's just joined us. We're just going to give it another couple of minutes to let people trickle in. Um, let's see. And just so that you all know, um, during the duration of the presentation, please feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat. Um, Sarah will, um, you know, look at those questions during the presentation, maybe answer them um, during um, and save some for after. And um, I'll make sure to put any resources that Sarah shares um, also in the chat. And we'll make sure that we get those resources to you sometime after the presentation as well. So don't feel like you're going to miss anything. We'll get that all for you um, at a later time. Okay, well, I guess let's get started. Um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library, so welcome. Um, so tonight we have presenter Sarah Lohman, um, and she is a culinary historian and the author of the best-selling book, Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine. She focuses on the history of food as a way to access the stories of diverse Americans. Her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and NPR. She has presented across the country from the Smithsonian Museum of American History in Washington, DC, to the culinary historians of Southern California. Her current project, Endangered Eating, Exploring America's Vanishing Cuisine, will be released with W.W. Norton & Co. in 2023. February marks the start of the maple syrup season in New England, and Sarah is here to walk you through the tree to pancake pipeline of maple syrup making. She'll talk about the sweet's connection to indigenous cultures and the abolitionists, then introduce you to the slow-growing maple trees of Nova Scotia, the Quebecois tradition of Cabana, Cabana Souk. I'm sure Sarah will correct my pronunciation on that later, and the Great Canadian Maple Syrup Heist. So send any questions, like I said, or any comments in the chat during the presentation, and Sarah can answer them as she goes along. And again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. So I will pass it over to Sarah. Hi, everybody. Hello to my favorite library in all of New England. It's always so good to be with you. Yeah, let's talk maple syrup. As always, my contact information is right up there on screen. You can drop questions in the chat. There's already been a good one that we're definitely going to talk about. Um, and pictured here is all maple syrup and maple sugar that was made uh, by my parents on my family's property. About a decade ago, I suggested to my parents that we start tapping our maple trees. This is, uh, they live a little south of Cleveland, Ohio. And at first my mom said, no, it's too much work. You have to have 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup, which is true. But I said, maybe we could make less than a, a gallon of maple syrup. Maybe we don't need that much. Now, I was just texting with my mom yesterday and she tapped 18 trees, uh, I think two or three days ago is when they started. So we really are in the start of the season. And I can talk about this a little bit through personal experience too. Now, obviously I am not talking about this maple syrup. In fact, when it's sold on the shelves, you can see that this log cabin is just labeled syrup. At best, it can be called maple flavored syrup because of course that's all it is. It's just uh, corn syrup with maple flavoring in it. Um, a while ago, I came across, if we still have it somewhere, but it was a promotional booklet for Caro maple syrup. No, excuse me, just Caro corn syrup, uh, light and golden. And the advertisement was pouring these cans of Caro all over pancakes. And I looked at it and said, ew, gross. Sorry, there is, uh, yeah, one of these right there. Um, so, and I was kind of posted it online and a friend of mine from South Dakota was joking. She was like, yeah, my brother and I used to argue about which one was better for pancakes, the, the light or the golden. And she said, as an adult, I've realized that both are disgusting. But then third take on it, I was like, but wait a minute, we've, we've all lived the lie, especially those of us, I think that grew up in the seventies and eighties of this fake, just like liquid sugar 
maple syrup. Like it's just, it's the same thing. At least the carrot advertisement was being honest in that you could just pour corn syrup onto your pancakes rather than, you know, putting a log cabin on it and making you think that it's real maple syrup. It's not. We're talking about real maple syrup tonight, which comes primarily from the sugar maple. We are going to talk about two other maple trees that are used to produce maple syrup. And actually, in theory, you can boil down the sap of any maple tree to make syrup. Um, there, you If you give it a Google online, because I don't think I have in this presentation, there is a ranking of the different sugar contents of different maple saps. And sugar maple is like off the charts. It's, it's the most by far. But like you can tap a silver maple. Um, some people, it, it, you know, it ends up being as opposed to a 40 to one ratio, 40 gallons of sap to one gallons of syrup ends up being like a 60 to one. As you get further down the list, it's like 80 or 90 to one. It's also not the only tree that you can make a, a crystallized sugar or sugar syrup from. Some of you might be familiar with like birch syrup, which I've never, I haven't gotten to try yet. Um, that is really popular in places like Eastern Europe and Russia. And here in this, in this continent in Alaska, it's produced quite a bit too, Actually, even in like the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, so the sugar maple tree though, is probably the most well-known and it also produces the highest quantity of sugar to sap. And yes, it is part of New England culture, but it is famously the maple leaf that is on the flag of Canada. So Canadians find maple so beloved that they have commemorated it on their flag. It is a truly indigenous food and very much of a place. And let's talk about where that place is. So this is the range of maple, excuse me, of sugar, sugar maple trees. And the best way to identify them is, wait, let me go back just for a second. They have, all maple trees have this five lobe leaf, like a hand. And some maple trees are deeper in between those lobes. But as you can see, sugar maples are actually pretty shallow. Like the palm, we might call it, of the leaf is quite wide compared to, uh, you know, there's, you don't really see deep, uh, come on brain, deep, chasms <laughs> between the lobes. And also in the fall too, there's some of the first trees to turn and they will turn a bright red or bright orange too. But if you are considering um, tapping trees on your property, it's always smartest to mark them in the summertime with some, usually just like a piece of bright plastic tape or something like that, or caution tape, something like that, so that they're easy to identify in sugaring season because as you probably notice, there aren't any leaves on the trees right now. And someone who's really, a really, really, really good arborist can identify a maple sugar tree by the bark. But why, why put yourself through that kind of trouble? Just pick them out in the summertime. Springs, springs that come in, pick out the trees, you'll be ready for next spring. So here is the range of sugar maple trees. Now, the question that already came through in the chat is, is this winter's mild weather going to have an adverse impact on maple syrup? Um, maple syrup is one of the wild foods that is uh, really endangered by climate change. So this is a wild food. We're going to talk about sugar bushes, which are basically like places where maple sugar is harvested. You can certainly plant maple trees, but you really can't cultivate maple trees. Um, you can't grow them in rows like corn. So um, so first of all, we have less control over it. And that actually is going to lead into the great maple syrup heist. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but for maple to produce sap uh, with a high sugar content, you need a very specific climactic condition. So first of all, you need a hard freeze over the winter. So if we get a mild winter and we don't get a hard freeze, you're not going to have maple syrup. But most importantly, you know when to tap the trees when you get a stretch of days where at night it's below freezing and at day it's above freezing. It's that sort of um, pressure difference and temperature difference that forces water out of the soil and up into the trees in huge quantities. And that season can last two weeks. It can last two months. Is, and you can get a couple days that dip you know, way below freezing and the flow of sap will slow down. You can get a couple days that go above freezing and the water is just gushing out of the trees. But once the maple trees start budding, which is when you see those like leaf buds getting really, really swollen and about to burst, that's when you have to quit. The syrup starts tasting off. 
Um, and it, there's not enough sugar in the sap at that point to be able to produce the syrup. So already we're talking about that if we don't get a hard freeze, we don't see maple syrup. Um, if we don't get nights that are below freezing at all, we don't get maple syrup. So when you look at this range, it probably surprises some people that the maple sugar range reaches all the way down to places like Tennessee. This whole thing is shifting northward. So within the next 50 years, we're not gonna see maple, uh, uh, sugar maple trees or maple syrup being produced in places like Tennessee, Virginia, probably Kentucky as well, but maybe West Virginia because of the altitude. That being said, the range will probably shift north. So we'll be able to grow maple, uh, sugar maple trees further north into Canada. Um, and also my cat, actually my housemate's cat just pooped and it's not running around the house singing about it. So I apologize if you can hear that in the background too. The other one's here too, he's sitting quietly. He's just helping me teach class right off the screen, the calmest boy. The other one is running wild as normal. Um, and uh, another additional interesting side effect of climate change is that in the sort of middle regions, like that's from like uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and up through New England. And then of course, like in Quebec and Nova Scotia, uh, we're actually seeing an uptick in production. Even if the season is shorter, uh, sugar makers are harvesting more sap in a shorter time um, and being able to produce more syrup as a result for it. So even though in some cases we're getting these shorter seasons, if you can get like a big enough swing back and forth, the cold temps and the warm temps, you can still produce a lot of maple syrup. That being said, there's a third side effect of all this. And for whatever reason, the sugar content in maple sap is changing. So whereas normally it's 40 to one, 40 gallons of sap to one gallon of syrup. Uh, and that by that, I mean, you harvest 40 gallons of sap, you have to boil it down and reduce it. And then you get one gallon of like the, the sugar to water consistency that we know of as maple syrup. Um, but now that's changing to be more like 50 to one. So climatologists, arborists, and scientists are not sure why the sugar content is dropping, why that would be. It might have something to do with the fact that the winters are milder. The trees don't have to store as many basically carbohydrates to get through the winter, um, but it's a little bit unclear at this point. So definitely maple syrup is going to be affected. Um, definitely it is hard to keep a wild product on the market because since there can be wildly different seasons, there's good seasons and bad seasons like any other wild product, um, for something to be commercial it needs to be consistent. So in America, at least, this is like a really small batch sort of community co-op grown at best uh, product. In Canada, it is more commercialized and industrialized, and we're going to get into why in just a little bit, but keep that in mind. Because if, let me put it this way, if Whole Foods has an order for 100,000 gallons of maple syrup, you can't have like boom and bust seasons and not be able to meet that, you know, one grocery season. So we'll talk more about that too. So this is truly an indigenous food. Sugar maple is from America. It grows only in that region. It is very much of a place. So it is a very, very like special American food that should be celebrated. And indigenous cultures throughout that entire range that I showed you all would harvest and process um, maple syrup. Uh, and at a certain point, turn it into maple sugar. I'm gonna turn you to show you some of those tools as well. Oh, one other climate change thing is I'm looking at my notes here. Um, it's believed within 50 years, the maple syrup season will adjust a full month earlier. Um, scientists have been looking at journals from the 19th century where they mark the start and end of their sugaring seasons. And in upstate Vermont, historically, they were capping trees at the end of March, beginning of April and stopping the syrup season at the beginning of May. And now that's uh, a month earlier, essentially, that it's much more common to tap in early March and finish up in April. And Southward in that range, like in Ohio, as I've said, my parents have already tapped the trees this past week, and they've tapped as early as the beginning of February at some points too. Sure a sign of spring, my mom always says. So I pulled this up. So for many of these indigenous cultures, this is truly a sacred food, and there are ceremonies to celebrate the start and the end of the maple sugaring season. Um, so in Anishinaabe tradition, so the Anishinaabe people are really around the Great Lakes, um, sort of focused throughout here. 
um, but also extending down through here. And originally the, they're Algonquin. So they started over here and about 60, 800 years ago, migrated to the West. So they're throughout what is now America and Canada. This is all the Anishinaabe territory. Um, and that's made up of a couple different tribal peoples, including like the Ojibwe. So um, they actually had uh, stories. They're sort of, uh, their religious hero is named Nanabuju. And he is sometimes known as the first man or sometimes as sort of a magical spirit that has human-like characteristics. And Nanabuju is a teacher of the people. He goes out and gains knowledge and then shows the people, but it's sometimes he's mischievous and can punish them. So in Anishinaabeg culture, it's believed that it used to be that the syrup flew, uh, flowed ready from the trees and that people got so lazy because they could just drink all of their nutrition from the trees um, that they began to take it for granted. And then it was Nana Buju who decided that it would take work, that he diluted this, the, the sap with water so that you had to pause and appreciate the gift of the maple syrup and maple sugar by processing it when, during the correct season. So already in this image, you can see some of the traditional tools used to harvest the maple syrup. Um, I'm gonna show you pictures of this in a modern facility too, but basically you pierce the trunk of the tree they're using taps made out of wood. Um, I'll, I'll show you a picture of that closer up, but the most important thing in this image is their birch baskets, which I think are so cool. They're folded out of individual sheets of birch bark so that there's no need, uh, there's no holes, there's no gaps or anything. And it's these buckets that are used to collect the sap out of the trees. I'm also just taking a look to make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Oh, here's the... Um, uh, a couple quotes from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's a member of the uh, Potawatomi Nation, and um, you might have heard of, uh, heard of or read her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. So she is the one who sort of wrote about this, this story of Nanabuju and says, today maple sap flows like a stream of water with only a trace of sweetness to remind the people of both of possibility and of responsibility. We participate in its transformation. It is our work and our gratitude that distills the sweetness. I think that's really cool. So I think maybe, you know, the better question too is I love this image of collecting sap. How historically did indigenous people process maple sap? Oh, there we go. There's a close up of a carved wooden tap. Um, the other side of it would have been sharp so that it could be pounded into a tree. And they also probably would have used some sort of stone tool or maybe a hardwood tool to drill a hole in the, in the tree to get it started too. And there is a close up of the sap. Uh, and this is a modern photo of sap in the birch basket. I'd really love to make a basket like that. I'd love to learn how. Um, so there's a couple different methods that uh, the sap was processed historically. And I know this is not, unfortunately, it's a low quality image, but it shows basically all the different methods in one that peoples in syrup, uh, syrup making regions used. One, you can kind of see down here that there is this wide log, wait, I think you have a better image. Let me look. Yeah, a slightly better image. So originally, um, nah, we'll go back to this one. Um, these were trunks that were carved out in the middle and the sap would go in the middle there. And because uh, you're still in a time in the spring where it's getting, thank you, he comes for library, um, where it's freezing overnight, the water in the maple syrup will freeze and come to the top. So you can even try this on your own too. If you're out there harvesting sap and wanna experiment, you can just leave the sap outside or put it in your freezer uh, ice will form on top and you just pull the ice out and throw it away. And then you do it again and again and again. And eventually it's not gonna reduce as much as modern methods where you boil it and let the water evaporate, but you do get a thick, sweet syrup. So that was the earliest method of doing it. Um, the next is you can see it happening here. And then we've got it in this image too with one of the older vessels that would have been used for freezing you can heat rocks and put that into the sap. And then it uh, em almost immediately brings the sap to a boil so that the water can evaporate. I've never tried this method. I'd really like to. I'm even almost tempted to fly to Ohio just to give this a whirl. I live in Las Vegas, um, so there's no maple trees here. Um, I, I get special, special packages from Ohio filled with maple syrup. Um, 
So, but this is the earliest heat method where flat rocks would be heated, put into the syrup. It also uh, introduces a little bit of like a caramelization to it too, which gives the syrup even more flavor and probably a little bit of smokiness too. Whenever you're evaporating over an open fire, some of that wood smoke smell is going to get into the syrup ultimately. And then the final method um, is after Europeans came, indigenous peoples began trading for things like cast iron pots. Um, and so boiling syrup in a cast iron pot was far easier and quicker and more efficient than the other two methods. So this is one of the reasons that indigenous people decided to trade with Europeans because the Europeans had tools that made their work easier to do, made it more efficient and effective as well. Now, maple syrup is pretty shelf stable, but of course you really have to get all of the water out for it not to go bad. You have to reach a point, um, after a certain point, sugar is a preservative. Uh, before a certain point, it encourages bacterial and yeast growth. And after a certain point, when something has so much sugar in it, things are not gonna grow in it. But the easiest way to make sure that maple uh, syrup is shelf stable is to continue to boil it down until it crystallizes. Now, this is how you make maple syrup, syrup, <laughs> maple sugar. You boil out all the water and then you heat the remaining liquid sugar to a certain temperature that makes sure it's gonna crystallize. And historically that syrup, uh, that really hot syrup was poured into wooden molds like this to finish crystallizing. And then the result were these blocks of maple sugar. This is a traditional mold. Obviously it's been processed in the modern day. And on the right, you can see a birch storage container for these uh, lumps of maple sugar. So particularly for the Ojibwe people around the Great Lakes, this is one of their two sacred foods, this and wild rice. And a lot of the contemporary and historical cuisine, you'll see the combination of these two foods, these two things served together. Because between wild rice, which is very nutritious and high in protein, and maple sugar, which is extremely high in carbohydrates, you can basically survive on just those two things. So even in the worst of times, in the worst foraging and unsuccess in hunting, you had these two uh, foraged processed foods that could sustain you throughout the year. And that's why these are considered basically gifts from God. Um, and maple syrup is processed in the spring and wild rice is processed at the end of summer, early fall. So you've got it coming at these two um, opposing points during the year. So here's how you do it in the modern era on a very small scale. This is my buddy, Mark. Um, my buddy, Mark, did this crazy project again about 10 years ago um, called the Starting from Scratch Challenge. He came up with it and then basically like him and his siblings participated and they spent a whole year trying to gather enough food farmed or foraged or hunted or fished to be able to survive. I think for a month is how long they went. It was, they did a whole blog about it. It was really amazing to watch. And so one of the things they did as a part of that was harvest their own maple sugar because this was all based in Northeast Ohio. So you have marked your trees during the summertime. You can see in this image, they just use some, some string. I recommend something that's like a little neon so it stands out in the wintertime. You use a drill to drill a hole in the tree. You then pound in a metal cap. You can get those online really easily. If you've guessed right and the season has started, as soon as you put that tap in, or as soon as you drill a hole in the tree, the sap is gonna start flowing out. Can you see it dripping? That, that's my mom. I don't, oh, I didn't share sound. I think I will. She's really funny. She just says, that one's really going, huh? That one's really going, huh? Yeah. She sounds really Midwestern there. Um, and then you use a mallet. No, go to the next slide. There we go. Use a mallet to pan in the, pound in the tap. And really it's like you've turned a faucet on. Right, the you tree bring... is just dripping sap. Give me the cap to put on the That so is the how you know that it is time. And you can you drink bring... the sap right out of the tree too. It is sterile. Um, it's really cold. It tastes really fresh and it is just like a hint sweet. So it's also a reliable water source too. Of course, it's just as common for the ground to be covered in snow at this point. So there's plenty of water around, but it is sort of a uh, refreshing beverage. Additionally, in uh, Eastern Europe and Northern Russia, birch sap is fermented. 
Um, or it's just like sold in buckets in the store too, to drink, but you have to drink it up because it does ferment. And also it can be made into a fermented drink too, but that doesn't seem to have been the case here. It was always processed into sugar. Just a lovely picture I took, um, I think this is three years ago. I went out with my parents, helped them tap the trees and it is always a nice experience. I mean, it's still chilly, but it's thawing and you can smell the earth. The birds are starting to sing again. It has that early spring light quality to it. And this food is flowing out of trees. It's really, really cool. So you collect it. So probably if you have sort of visited a maple syrup tourist destination, you've seen a system like this. So you've got the tap in the tree and there's a bucket that hangs off of it. This is a system that's probably been in use since the 18th or 19th century. There are some major disadvantages to this. There are buckets that will have lids on them to stop just random stuff from falling in it. Because if you leave it open, like there's leaves, there's pine needles, there's bugs, there's whatever. But even with the lids that are kind of flappy on top of it, um, one of the biggest issues is that mice will get in there and then drown because they're attracted by like the liquid or by the sweet. And so then that's gross. You have to throw that out. So um, there's a couple ways to do it in the modern method. My parents use food safe containers, whether it's big jugs or barrels like this, and they run uh, plastic tubing directly from the tap into um, the food safe containers. And so they've got snap on lids or screw on lids. And so nothing is getting in there and drowning, which is sad and also making uh, this gross. And you can see this is like their neighbor's lawn there. They have about three acres. It's not a huge property. And like I said, they tapped 18 trees. And considering my parents are both in their seventies, I'm glad that they're like getting out there, moving around. This though is what a commercial processing facility will look like. Um, this technology is really, really developed in about the last 20 years. And these are for really, really big sugar bushes, um, maple syrup processors that they will attach this tubing directly to the taps in the tree. Oh, by the way, if you have a bigger tree, you can put multiple taps in one tree, just depends on the size of it. And then the um, sap, sap is drawn into a sugar house where it will be processed either by, um, you know, this, like it's steeper, it's up on a hill and you put the sugar house at the bottom of the hill, but usually there has to be a little bit of suction running through these pipes too. So for communities that set this up, for farmers that set this up, they'll actually start doing this maybe about a month before the official start of the sugaring season, because even though this makes the sap collection process simpler than my mom who like goes out there with a wagon and like, you know, dumps things into a bigger barrel, um, it's, it's still done by hand. You know, a, a handful of people are having to pound, tap those trees, pound the taps in and uh, attach all this tubing. And then at the end of the season, you pull the taps out and you put a plug in to stop basically disease um, from getting into the tree. And then you just try to tap at a different point the next year. So then you got to process it 40 to one, remember? So you can do it outside the literal fashion way or when just evaporate the water with an open container. My mom is a crazy person. Now she's not a crazy person, but she does it inside. She'll uh, uses a really sort of wide pan and boils it on top of her stove and opens up all the windows and sets up this whole series of fans. I don't know how the wallpaper isn't peeling in there. And then she'll finish it off um, in the microwave. It's the easiest way to do the final little bit of evaporation and to get the most control. And on the right, this is, she always sends me a photo of the first processed syrup of the season. And what's sort of fascinating about maple syrup is that it changes color and flavor over the course of the season. The earliest syrup is really, really light. It's often very vanilla and sort of buttery. And then it's later in the season that you get the really dark and maple flavored stuff. This light stuff doesn't even taste like what I would consider maple syrup. It has a super, super delicious, but really light flavor. And it's the dark syrup that has that really strong maple quality to it. That's end of season syrup. Um, modern commercial facilities also use a, uh, a process called reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is most commonly used to purify water. It's basically running water through a very fine filter. Um, and there are other things involved in that too. Hang on, hang on. The description I have basically says, oh, it runs water through a semi-permeable membrane that is used to separate water from salt, sugar, minerals, and other impurities. But in this case, ironically, what you want is the impurity, which is the maple sugar and the other trace minerals and things in that. 
So with reverse osmosis, you can remove up to 50% of the water content of syrup. And so then you reduce the, you still have to boil, but it reduces that boiling time really significantly. And um, this company, the Vermont Evaporator Company has even started to make tiny ones for home use. Um, although I checked on the website, this says coming in 2023, and now it says coming in 2024. So maybe they're still working on it. But this is a little tiny home evaporator or basically reverse osmosis machine that uh, I think it says it does 12 to 13 gallons of sap per hour um, and takes out about 50% of the water. So if you're really getting serious about home syrup making, Vermont Evaporator Company is worth looking at. Um, after the reverse osmosis process, commercial facilities then use these evaporated pans. They are electric as, a, as opposed to wood or microwave like my mom. And the most important feature about them is that they are, the, they are really shallow and wide. And it gives a lot of surface to the sap, which means that more water can evaporate more quickly. So I bet you're thinking about grading at this point. By the way, we're going to move away from the processing as I talk about the grading. So if you have any questions about anything I've mentioned so far, please feel free to stick it in the chat. Okay. So the grading system recently changed within like the past five or six years because it didn't really make sense. The original grading system, which actually started in Vermont and then was adopted internationally, is on the left. Um, there was grade A light amber, grade A medium amber, grade A dark amber, grade B or grade A extra dark, and commercial grade, which is very dark. Um, the reason this was changed is because when you call something grade A and grade B, it makes it seem like there's a difference in quality when there actually is not. As I already mentioned, syrup gets darker and more flavorful, more mapley over the course of the season. So a grade A light amber is the first syrup you make. And then the, what is the commercial grade, the number three dark, that would be like the last of the season. But there's not a quality difference. There's just a flavor difference. And I think that the, the really dark mapley stuff is the best. So now in a way that it's even more confusing because everything is just called grade A, fine, but basically it's grade A golden, amber, dark, and very dark. Um, and so now the descriptors just refer to the color and how strong that flavor is going to be too. So as the colonizers came to the United States, European began taking on sugar making as well. It was sort of one of the the earliest um, seasons for farm labor in places like New England, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, and Canada too. And it was definitely a community event. Many hands make quick work. So you can see basically all of those processes happening, the harvesting, the evaporation, the processing of the sap. But what's interesting too about maple syrup in America is that it was really um, praised and adapted by abolitionists. Um, here is a quote from Thomas Jefferson himself. Uh, he wrote in 1790 to a friend of maple syrup, what a blessing to substitute a sugar which requires only the labor of children for that which it is said renders the slavery of the blacks unnecessary. So interesting quote really sums up the attitude. Abolitionists really wanted Americans to use um, maple sugar which was slave free as opposed to sugarcane, which was grown in the South and the Caribbean and was produced with enslaved labor. Um, it's interesting on two levels because it's interesting that Jefferson is like child labor. Oh, it's just child labor. So, you know, we're still in the era when people didn't really have a childhood and uh, child labor was nominally better than the labor of the enslaved. But more importantly, this is 1790 when Jefferson is still a relatively young man and an ardent abolitionist. But later on in life, he just kind of like ignores young Jefferson and forgets about what he said. Uh, and Jefferson owned over 600 uh, enslaved people in his lifetime and freed very, very, very few of them. Didn't even free them in his will. They were actually sold off to pay his debts because he was in a lot of debt. So he's a very complicated person. And actually even more interesting, some of his friends uh, from the revolution visited him later in life and like called him out on not uh, liberating his enslaved people. But early on, he was an abolitionist and he believed that everybody should be um, using maple sugar. 
On the right, you can see there are sugar bowls for abolitionists. This is a little bit like the Black Lives Matter of the 19th century, where you can advertise that you are not using um, sugar made by the enslaved. In this case, it's a sugar bowl for cane sugar, but it could also be used for ground uh, maple sugar too. This is such an interesting movement to me because the sort of food labeling and also the sort of protest uh, or trying to make social change through your wallet is certainly something we do today. Definitely when we think about like the fair trade labeling of certain products, and even there's a chocolate company um, that has designated their chocolate to be slave free because there is a huge issue with enslaved labor and child labor on plantations in Western Africa um, that are owned by places like Nestle. Um, who are producing chocolate, basically being forced to produce chocolate. So there are also companies out there that will not, that be into bars, another example, um, slave free is a great example. And then fair trade is a, um, a labeling that is not just in chocolate, but in many other products as well. So in, in a lot of ways, it's very, very similar. And you can see recipes that sort of reflect that. Um, I pulled this one from, um, Catherine Beecher, who was Harriet Beecher Stowe's author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's her sister. Um, their father, too, was a real firebrand, reverend, abolitionist, like social change person. Catherine Beecher wrote a cookbook in the 1840s, and she has a recipe for molasses candy, um, but she actually suggests uh, in the recipe to substitute maple syrup and make that into candy. And actually, I did. This is on my old blog, Four Pounds Flour. Um, and it's really tasty. I just did it with nuts, um, but she also recommends basically corn nuts, which sounds really good too. Yeah, corn nuts and maple sugar. Tasty. So let's come back to the second because I want to say one more thing about abolitionism. Um, yeah, so the ultimate goal in the encouragement of eating, consuming maple sugar as opposed to cane sugar was because cane sugar along with cotton and tobacco was a major crop produced by enslaved labor. They thought by not purchasing uh, cane sugar, they could get rid of uh, slavery in America. Um, it didn't work. I mean, certainly it, it's an important movement and being outspoken about that contributed. And also that kind of uh, goes into the present day tune to how we think about what foods we buy, what, the lab what labor was used to produce them and where they're coming from. Um, and interesting, it was sort of hard to get people to do this because the flavor of something like maple was really in a way associated with poverty. White sugar was a luxury, it was highly processed, it was expensive. Um, and so if you were a homesteader, if you were a farmer, if you could only afford what the labor of your children produced, the maple sugar from your trees, that meant all of your baked goods, any your coffee, your tea, anything you wanted sweetened would always taste like maple. And so we consider that a very pleasant flavor today, but it's because we're not forced to consume it as our only sugar all the time. So um, a lot of people had negative associations with maple syrup, and especially in the decades post-slavery, people went back to consuming cane sugar in great qualities because it had a neutral flavor and a neutral flavor equals wealth. Luckily, we've come back around to appreciating how tasty maple syrup is. Oops. So we need to talk about Quebec because Quebec produces nearly 75% of all of the maple syrup and maple sugar in the world. It is the major producer, um, considering 25% uh, is produced in all of the other Canadian provinces and American states. It's absolutely enormous. And much like here in America, it is a very much a part of their cultural tradition, both of the indigenous people there, but also of the French colonists. There is a tradition to this day of sugar sack, sugar shacks. That word is harder to say than cabane et sucre, which basically means it's like sugar cabin. So it's a sugar shack. And the sugar shacks are located in sugar bushes, places where there are lots of sugar maple trees where the syrup is collected and um, produced. And the deal with them is you pay, oh, there's even a fancy one now called La Pied de Cochon, um, which Anthony Bourdain went to this one. You can look up the No Reservations Montreal episode and he walks you through all the courses. Um, I was supposed to go here and to other sugar sack shacks at the trip all planned. Friends were going to join me and it was March 2020 and you can guess what happened. So it's lucky that we canceled the trip when we did because basically the border shut down the day we would have gone and still haven't been back. But doing this talk 
has reminded me to revisit this trip. Um, what do you get at the sugar shacks, uh, like the, the cabana sucre? Um, I'm going to read you some and it's going to make you hungry. And I am sorry in advance. Um, okay, here we go. Here's a typical menu and actually, yeah, all maple all the time. They're communal and they're like buffet style and you pay a set fee to go eat for two hours. And here are some of the foods you can eat. Keep in mind that they all contain maple syrup. Ham, bacon, sausages, baked beans, scrambled eggs, pork rinds, pancakes, but really crepes because it's Montreal. I think we do better on the pancake and waffle front than uh, Canada does, than the world does, frankly. Uh, and sugar pie, which is basically pie made of maple syrup. I'm also looking almost be a quiche thing. There's some sort of meat pie, there's potatoes. Oh my gosh, I'm really, now I am really, really hungry. Oh, and then of course, oh, this is one of the other, ones I was going to go to. And it's like a festival. There's lots of activities, as you can see. Tous les activités. There's pea soup. There's salade de choux, lettuce salad. There's bread and butter. There's syrup uh, just on the table. There is pork, 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 uh, roast potatoes, um, <laughs> saucisse dans le syrup. Maple syrup, everything. Maple syrup, everything, all the time. These are images from that same sugar shack I was going to go to. Donuts and little cakes. Now I'm just sad that I didn't get to go. But this is one of the, you have to have this at a cabin de souk, or I'm sure some of you, if you've gone to like pancake breakfasts here in America, you might have seen this as well. Um, and if you live in a very cold, snowy region, you can make this yourself. You take the maple syrup, you boil it to which is the temperature of uh, the hard crack stage in candy making. You go outside and you press some snow flat. Uh, it's kind of nice to do it like in a rimmed baking sheet. And then you pour the maple syrup into the snow. It gets hard almost instantly or almost like taffy-like. And then you can either just pick it up and eat it and eat this chewy taffy, or you can roll it onto popsicle sticks and suck it like a sucker. And it's delicious and it's pure sugar. It's a lot of sugar, but it's really fun to do. It's very sciencey and then very delicious afterwards. Look for instructions online. I have done this in Vermont too. It was really fun. So I already mentioned earlier too that in order to put a wild food on market, it's difficult because you've got boom and bust years. There will always be good and bad seasons for harvest, regardless of climate change. So Canada, in order to become the world's commercial producer of maple syrup, created the Global Strategic Maple Syrup Reserve. And basically what they do is they, they um, all of their maple syrup processors sell their product to the government. I think they're allowed to hold back a little bit for like a one-to-one -one sales, like if they have a, a little shop on their processing facility in their sugar bush or whatever, or like in their cabin de sucre. But the majority, uh, anything they're not selling, they can't sell wholesale, that's what I'm trying to say. So anything they would sell wholesale gets sold to the government. And this essentially works like a co-op. So then it's the co-op that, that brokers deals with Quaker who wants to make a maple syrup cereal, right? Or even just sells to the commodity market, like let's say here in America or abroad in South America, Europe, places where there isn't native grown uh, sugar maple trees. But in order to do that, in boom years, they'll buy more syrup and put them into a reserve. So that means if the next year there isn't enough syrup to sort of meet all of the orders and keep stop the market from fluctuating, they can pull on the reserve. And they actually did this last year. Last year was a bad season in Canada. Um, it was short, the trees underproduced. So they released barrels from the reserve to sort of meet the global demand. So in order to keep a wild product consistent, you have to develop a reserve. You have to put extra back in the boom years so that you can make up the difference in the bust years. Now, people don't often think about that, especially products like maple syrup, uh, these are known as value added products and that you have to do uh, an extra step of processing in them, which makes them more valuable. Um, alcohol is the same thing, chocolate, vanilla extract. These are all value added products. Um, they're really expensive. Uh, produce can be really expensive. And there actually is quite a bit of like food crime out there. I have two um, watching, I wish, I don't think there's a book on food crime, unfortunately, but there's a Netflix documentary series called Dirty Money. 
And at season one, episode five is all about the maple syrup height, excuse me, the maple syrup heist worth watching. And there's also a great podcast called Gastropod. And they did a whole episode about food crime too, where literally people, you know, will steal trucks of cherries that are worth, you know, $100,000. Now, interestingly, I, someone just sent me an article about this this morning because a man in Britain stole a truckload of Cadbury cream eggs. It's only worth about $48,000. So I don't know exactly what he intended on doing with all of those cream eggs. So that being said, let me look up the year this went down because I've just forgotten. Mm -mm -mm -mm. The reserve started in the year 2000. So it's only a little over 20 years old. It's not that long ago. So summer of 2012, once a year, uh, the government employees responsible for the reserve take inventory and see how much they have. And uh, one of the employees was kind of clambering over these very Indiana Jones-esque like towers of maple syrup barrels. When the maple syrup barrels are full, they weigh about 600 pounds. So they're normally very, very stable. But he's climbing up one of these piles and one of the barrels comes loose and he almost falls and dies. And they think that's unusual. So they check the barrel and they discover that it's empty. And they think, okay, this must be a fluke. But as they continue to do inventory that year, they find more empty barrels and even worse, barrels that have been filled with water. So it's a multi-year um, investigation where they discover that nearly 10,000 barrels of syrup were stolen and served, uh, sold on the black market, basically by middlemen who would go to Europe or go to the Americas and sell it wholesale um, without the permission of the Canadian government, who again is only the only piece people in Canada who can legally sell maple syrup. Um, the people who did this were eventually caught. Um, the 10,000 barrels is, a, is about 540,000 gallons. Um, that's about 12% of the reserve. And the street value of that much maple syrup in 2012 was $13.4 million. So this is no tiny crime. Um, originally, this was this was an inside job. It was employees. Um, basically, they were referred to as like a gang. It was like a maple syrup stealing gang, maple syrup laundering gang um, would take barrels out of the reserve at night, siphon them off at their sugar shacks, fill it up with water and replace the barrels. But then eventually they worked out a system where overnight they were siphoning out of the barrels directly in the facilities within the warehouse. Um, Four men have been brought to trial. You can get more details of this when you watch the maple syrup heist later tonight, as I'm sure you will. It's all interviews and original footage. And I think a couple of them have been sentenced and they I mean, they've gone to jail for a really long time. And it does also a pretty good job of, of um, giving both sides of the story. A lot of the small producers are really mad that they can't sell their own maple syrup. And also in order to keep the amount of syrup available consistent, um, the government sets a limit on how many like barrels, how many gallons of syrup you can produce within a year. So even if it's a really, really, really good year, you can't produce beyond that amount because then the market will crash and everybody will lose money. But the individual producers are like, well, what about me, me, me? It's, it's, I'm not going into it all here, but it is very interesting. So this is what I was talking about. You can look into this a little bit too, but last year they did need to tap their strategic reserves. Um, so we'll see what happens this year. I don't know what the winter has been like in Canada. The season is a little, uh, my, my mom thinks it's gonna be a short season because I believe the temperature in Ohio was in the seventies yesterday, but she says there's also a cold front going in. So sometimes the season can end up lasting six weeks. So we'll see what happens this year. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about, uh, and again, as I kind of wrap up here, if you do have questions, thank you. The, the link to the documentary is in the chat. Um, feel free to pop them in the chat. But there are two really interesting maple syrups on the market that I, one of them I have tried and one of them I have not. So one of them is known as Klikut Gold. And this comes, interestingly, from the West Coast. So that maple syrup range is all Midwest and East Coast. These come from big leaf maples that grow on the West Coast. And this particular grower, this is an indigenous uh, uh, people, an indigenous company. Um, the, I actually do not know how to pronounce their name. I apologize, um, but you can see it. 
I don't want to make an attempt. Be disrespectful. It was right there. Um, and they started producing this maple syrup. It's sold tribally. I don't think you can actually, it doesn't ship to America. Maybe this is worth looking into. Um, so I've never tasted it, but I, you know, it's supposed to taste really, really different. Um, it says this maple syrup gets its unique vanilla and caramel flavors from local big leaf maples trees. These are Canada's largest maple trees. Um, and in British Columbia, they only grow on Vancouver Island's West Coast. So I am curious to try this different tree, different syrup. Oh, this is what the this is what they look like. These really like primordial wide leaf maple forests. So cool. It's there's a lot of rainforests up there. Thank you. There's a link to that maple syrup in the chat. And the other one we're going to talk about is Nova Scotia Old Growth Maple Syrup. There's no one company that produces it. There are actually quite a few. Acadian Maple is one of the ones that ships to America relatively easily. And I have tried this and it was last year. And so unfortunately I didn't make like tasting notes, but it was also, it was really, really good and sort of extra rich and really, I don't know. Okay. Here's what they say about it. The deal with these trees is that they grow really, really slowly. So it takes them longer to get to a point of maturity where you can actually tap them. Um, and they're, I believe, just a different variety of sugar maple. And because of the climate there, they tend to grow very slow. So there was a study done, uh, excuse me. There was a study done relatively recently and it says that the product here is unique, that there are 24 phenolic compounds that give the syrup a very complex flavor. It contains coniferal alcohol, vanillic acid, that's the vanilla flavor. And those are two really big flavor components in maple syrup. And they were found in a greater concentration in um, samples from this area compared to other areas of Canada and the Northeastern United States. So it says it takes up to 80 years to reach a minimum size for tapping compared to 20 to 40 years in the United States. So also, so same thing kind of, Quebec has its sugaring culture, which really is like March and April, because um, again, further north, the trees get tapped later. Ditto in Nova Scotia, they don't have the Caban de Sucre, but they have all these little sugaring houses and these incredibly old, beautiful forests that you can go visit. And someday I will. And, and it was worth getting the little jug of, a, of Acadian maple that I got. It was really pretty tasty. That's it. That's maple syrup. So. Um, do some more work, eat some maple syrup, go to, I mean, I feel like I need some right now. I luckily have a little jar from last year in the fridge, um, but I, it's a food that I really, really love because it is so local, um, but not to Las Vegas. So maybe it's this time of year that I do miss being out East a little bit. So there you have it. Are there any questions? Hello. If not, that's okay too. And you're always welcome to follow up with me on social media if you're curious. Awesome. Does anyone last chance, any questions in the chat? So, oh, so there's one that says, sometimes you have a hard time getting nice syrup at the end. Any suggestions? Yeah, um, this, is, this becomes more of my parents' territory, um, but it really has to do with how much water is being boiled out versus the proportion of sugar. So you can do, there is a tool that you can use to test the sugar content of the syrup and wait for it to get to that sugar saturation uh, as opposed to like a certain temperature. Look for that online. I can't think of the name of what a sugar measuring tool is. It's a something thermometer. We are doing seven degrees over the BP. Yeah, sometimes it just needs to be cooked a little bit more. But as I mentioned too, like uh, there, there is now a significant difference in um, sugar quantity, sugar percentage as well. So my parents often, sometimes have the same problem where sometimes it comes out a little bit more watery, but it also might be because the sugar concentration is down in a particular year. Uh, I see that there's one in the queue. Okay, I see a couple questions. So uh, I see your question, Joy. I'm gonna answer uh, Karen's first, I'll come back to you. Once you open maple syrup, how long does it last? Basically indefinitely, but I would keep it in the fridge. Um, the sugar should have a sugar point that is high enough that nothing nasty is gonna grow in there. But just in case, I always keep mine in the fridge. Um, yeah, it'll be fine. 
does the tap place on trees always have to be different each year? It should be. It makes for a healthier tree rather than continuing to damage the same place. Additionally, once you put the, um, the bung into the hole to seal it up at the end of the season, the tree begins to heal and sort of like go over that. So if you drill back into the same place, you're actually going to be drilling into like the hardwood bung that you put in there to seal the hole. So it um, is better to go to different places. Okay. Lots of other places. Can you suck the syrup out of the tree to get more or do you always just have to wait? Just gotta wait. And on days when it's warmer, the syrup is going to flow faster because you have to wait because not all the sap, the sap is in the tree yet. It's water that's being pulled up through the roots and into the trunk. So that's gonna happen as fast as it happens. It's not like a canteen where it's all in there already. It can be stored in the freezer. And in fact, again, if you're making your own, that's a good step to get a little bit more water out at either the start or the finish. If there's frozen, if there's ice on the top of your syrup, just get rid of it. That's just water that's been frozen out. What's the nutritional difference between maple syrup and honey? Um, they've different, they have different trace minerals. We'd have to look them up individually. I don't have it memorized to see what is what. And let me just look, here's the one thing I'm curious about. I think they're both sucrose. That's the, the sugar molecule, which is also cane sugar. But let me just ask real, ask Google really quick. What sugar molecule is, oh, and honey is also an inverse sugar. I'll explain that in a minute, is maple sugar. Maple sugar is sucrose which is the same sugar molecule in cane sugar. If you got it down to a pure form, it would taste just the same as cane sugar, just like sweet. The flavor differences come from all of the other little elements, the, the minerals, the, the trace, whatever's are in there. Okay, is honey. Oh, interesting. So they're different sugars. So maple syrup is sucrose and honey is glucose and fructose. Fructose is the sugar that is in fruit. Fructose, yes. And I see honey beers invert the sugar with their digestive enzymes, the mixture of fructose and glucose. Thank you. Inverted sugar uh, in day-to-day -day terminology just means it's a sugar that is liquid at room temperature. And yes, if you, you know, we think of maple syrup as a syrup form, but that's because there's still water in it. If you boil it all the way down, it crystallizes. And yes, honey can crystallize, but it's not quite the same process. It always goes back to a liquid state. What it means technically is that inverse sugar has to do with the way the molecules are. And when you shine light through it, what it does, it's a whole thing. But like corn syrup is an inverse sugar, honey is an inverse sugar. As far as, and as far as trace minerals, I would just look up the nutritional information for maple syrup versus honey. None, neither of them, let me emphasize this, are healthy for you. They're, they're all sugars, okay? Fruit is better for us because there's a lot of other things in there vitamins, minerals, fiber, um, and we process fruit differently than we do pure sugars. So every sugar should be used in moderation, whether it's highly processed sucrose and white sugar form, whether it's maple syrup, whether it's honey, it is all sugar, okay? So some of them don't cause the same blood sugar spikes as others, like date sugar, when you eat a date, doesn't. But like once you get it down to the pure fructose, glucose, or sucrose, a sugar is a sugar is a sugar. Um, does maple sugar spoil if it's really been left out forever? I mean, don't leave it out forever. If maple syrup, syrup will be bad if it's actively growing things. Uh, I've never had an incident where it smells weird or tastes off. Um, and it's only going to grow things really if it's got too much water in it. But for the most part, it's a pretty shelf-stable product. You don't necessarily have to put it in the refrigerator or the freezer. I just do just to be safe because what I am consuming is homemade. Like if you buy something at the grocery store, it can go into the cabinet. Since mine is homemade and it's a little bit like, you know, kind of eyeballing it, um, I keep it in the, the refrigerator just to make sure it lasts longer. But if it's off, you will be able to visually see it. That being said, if you ever get maple syrup that has like a little bit of stuff in the bottom, like uh, it can be crystallized sugar or what's known as sugar sand. Sugar sand just looks like some particulate matter like down at the bottom of the jar or the bottle. Um, and that's really just things like minerals that have settled out of the syrup. It's not bad for you. You know, they kind of stay at the bottom. You can pour the syrup off. Um, and it's really, really common. I think there's a few more questions. Hang on. Where does one, oh, any brands do you recommend? Um, I just recommend um, 
it 100% real maple syrup. That's the most important part. A lot of the brands you find in the grocery store are um, like co-ops. So they're sort of blended for consistency. Um, there are a couple places out of Vermont that I really like. There's this really beautiful, hold on, let's see if I can find it really quick. It's like um, a maple syrup that they infuse with different flavors, which I think is cool. Hang on, flavored maple syrup, Vermont. And I'll see if I can find the brand. Yeah, run amok, run amok maple and more. Maybe we can drop that in the chat. It's all run word, one word run uh, muck. I really like their products, both their plain syrup and um, they do a barrel aged maple syrup, which is so good. And then they do um, not flavored, but like infused maple syrups, really, really tasty. And there's probably for any of you, I mean, there's plenty of maple syrup makers in Massachusetts, in Connecticut and upstate New York and Northeast Ohio, Maine, head up to Nova Scotia and get some. Where does one get the plug to close the tap? The internet. You know, you can order from Amazon or you can order from basically maple sugaring supply stores. That's where you can get all, everything from the metal buckets to the food safe barrels, to the tubing, to the taps, to the plug, um, the mallet you might have to get at Home Depot. Is it true that you could just eat honey your whole life? If so, can you do the same with syrup? No, you can't just eat honey your whole life. Um, I, maybe you can and maybe would live, but you wouldn't be healthy. No, it's their sugars. So they're very um, carbohydrate dense and we need carbohydrates to survive. Um, in particular, we need uh, honey. They probably say that about because we do, our brains need glucose to work. We, it needs that very specific sugar and fructose and sucrose are both energy, but no, you would, you would get very, very sick. You would not be getting, that's not a whole and healthy balanced diet. I don't, I, I don't think you were actually planning on doing that, but I had not heard that. And it is not true. I'm also not someone that subscribes to those cleanses, which is like honey and cayenne. It's not good for you. You're starving. Your, your body is set, dying. These are really great questions though. Hmm, Ackerman Maple Syrup from Vermont sells at local farmers markets here and it's excellent. That's wonderful. And I don't know, my brother lives in the Boston area. Um, oh no, you probably like food just, just enough. I do too. Um, but I'm sure that there's maple syrup makers out there too, even though Massachusetts isn't as known as a place like Vermont or New Hampshire, like the trees are there, um, just not along the ocean. It's always a little warmer along the ocean, but anywhere in that range, you're gonna find local maple syrup producers. These are wonderful questions and suggestions too. What does four pounds flour mean? So that is the name of my first blog that I launched in 2008, which started my career um, within a couple months of starting that blog. I had my first public speaking gig. And within a couple of years, I had my first book deal. Um, it can, comes from a recipe, an early American recipe for wedding cake. And that's exactly how the recipe starts, four pounds flour. And I just thought, damn, that is a big cake. And so that's just how I adapt the name. I liked the sound of it. So since I started my social media accounts way back when I was first getting started, that's why, thank you. Um, that's why I have that as my handle. And if you go, my I don't run on my blog anymore, but the archives are up. You can find that maple syrup candy recipe. You can also find um, photos and descriptions of the whole sugaring process. And there's a couple other recipes for maple syrup up there too, including moose milk, which is kind of like this like, creamy punch that you're supposed to like chill out in the snow too. That's a really fun one. Speaking of books, I should mention, I have a new one coming out in October. It's called Endangered Eating, Exploring America's Vanishing Food. And that's actually, I was supposed to go on this maple syrup research trip to Quebec for that book to talk about how climate change is affecting our foods. Because the whole book is about rare and endangered foods and why they're disappearing and what we can do to change that. I ended up swapping in something else that was just as fun since COVID canceled that trip and everybody's trips for everyone. Um, but I will definitely, I'm sure, be back here talking to you about that book as we get closer to it coming out and as we get into pre-sales. I'm really, really excited to share it. And I think no, knowing you all at this point, I think you're all really going to like it. Awesome. Thank you so much for everyone for um, asking your questions and putting through your comments in the chats. Really appreciate it. 
Um, and thank you, Sarah, so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Always enjoy your presentations. I definitely have a better appreciation for maple syrup now. So thank you. Good. And um, we will definitely make sure that everyone gets some of the resources that um, we threw up in the chat and that Sarah had talked about in her presentation, as well as um, letting you guys know about Sarah's books. One of them is here at the library. So please check that out. That was also left in the chat. Um, and keep an eye out for an email with the recording, as well as a list of these resources too in your email emails, hopefully at some point soon. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye, Sarah. Thank you.